that's something that we want to address now or later. We have I would the like to address it now. Uh, I'm, you know, deferring uh, to give the state an opportunity to interpose whatever objection they wanted to, um, so that we wouldn't delay the proceedings yesterday and I could get uh, some of the witnesses that weren't tied up in that issue. The witnesses, some of the witnesses I have coming back, I uh, obviously want to use that exhibit, so I would like to resolve now. Okay. Has the state had an opportunity to go through? The um, defense exhibit. We 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 went through it. Um, we we would agree. Police reports. I don't believe police reports are uh, business records, so those shouldn't shouldn't come in. The um, reports, to the extent that they are internal uh, uh, information shared between members of the police agency. Um, and are done at or near the time of the event, those, I believe, would qualify as business records, and we don't have an objection to those. All right, well, have you had a chance, Mr. Respis, to go through those records specifically and note which ones you're objecting to? Because you're asking, perhaps you're asking me to go uh, and make the rulings, but I'm not sure what particular records are. We can are... go through page by page, and I'll tell you. Okay, so the state hasn't had a chance to do that. We have, we, have, we have preliminarily gone through them. That's why I asked the witness the questions uh, that I did because I, I saw that there were there's a record from my office. That's not a business record. Okay, well, I guess I need to know specifically the that documents was, that you're objecting to so that then I can hear further arguments from right. defense and state and rule on those um, objections. So. I just, again, I don't want to delay these proceedings and have witnesses waiting or the jury waiting. So um, will that prevent the defense from proceeding with the next witness or? It, it would hamper me from proceeding with the next witness because I don't have some of these things in evidence. The next witness, uh, serious witnesses, are people that responded to those calls. How much time does the state need to go through these records to determine if there are any particular records that you're objecting to? Uh, probably 10 minutes. Any objection to taking a 10-minute recess? Whatever the court wishes. Okay. We'll take a 10-minute recess. Thank you. We're back on the record in case number 2012-CF55504A, State of Florida versus William Woodward. I'll note the presence of Mr. Woodward at council table with Mr. Eisenminger and Mr. Robinson and the presence of Mr. Shiner on behalf of the state. Um, has the state had an opportunity to go through the, um, was it defense exhibit, is it one? I'm sorry, A? Uh, I don't even know that it's in yet, Judge. I, I, I mistakenly said one, but is it A? P. P, excuse me. So those are the uh, records from the Titusville Police Department. Has the state had an opportunity to go through those? We have, Judge, and we've pinched off with a binder clip the center portion. I didn't. I didn't count the pages. As you can see, it's a lengthy document. But we believe that that portion of that exhibit is would be hearsay. Those are police reports, and narratives, and witness statements. Uh, so those are not admissible. It's our position that we are not offering the truth of the matter asserted, but offering to explain the actions or inaction. Meaning those are not being presented for the truth of the matter asserted. They're not offered for the truth, and there's no relevance, Judge. It's documented that the police were there. We called several witnesses to discuss with them what they've done and what they haven't done. Uh, there's a statute right on point that long that police reports is in trial. So again, we are offering to show the actions, or more importantly in this case, the inaction of the Tyson Police Department for the truth of the assertions there, but rather to explain their conduct or lack of conduct. Okay, well, I, 
I can't even estimate how many pages have been clipped off separately that the uh, state is objecting to. Um, and to go through page by page, it sounds like that's probably what we need to do, um, unless, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at these to make a finding either way. I know the defense is arguing that they're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. There are many, many statements that are made throughout um, various uh, individuals, it appears, which um, under the case law, I think, is inadmissible as simply a business record. It's difficult for me even to reference them without these pages being numbered. So perhaps we need to just number them at least through that portion and then go through those particular pages that there's an objection to and court can make a finding as to whether they are or are not hearsay and, and admissible as a business record. So. <clears throat> So you all didn't think to do this before this morning? Well, um, I know there were other issues to research as well. well but. And, and, you know, we've made our, our objection. We're, we're showing you the portion. I mean, it's, it, they had the records, and, and we didn't know they were going to do this until they ultimately did it. We saw the records. Um, I'm making the objection because most of that stuff is not a business record. And the reason it's not a business record is it's not uh, a compilation of data from the business. It's a compilation of information from people outside of the business. Right. I mean, that's the first step to determine whether they are even properly admitted through the business record exception, right. whether they're being offered for the truth of the matter asserted or not. Right. I mean. If, if it doesn't meet the business record exception, then it shouldn't be included by right. this way of business certification in right. these records. So um, <clears throat> how do you respond to that issue, Mr. Eisenmenger, in terms of even if you're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted, certain records even qualifying for business record exception? I, I'm, I'm familiar with the Carter versus State case, which is 951 Southern 2nd, 939, Fourth District Court of Appeal case. It talks about witness statements not being admissible as a business record exception. Are you aware of any other case law to support your argument that these would be proper business records? I'm not aware of any other case law to support the position. As I said, I believe the predicate of all of these are records kept in the regular course of business. Uh, the business records exception, they've all been authenticated. Uh, some of them are clearly admissible under the business records exception. All of them have been authenticated. Uh, and those that fall under the purview of the case law that the court uh, talked about as being uh, hearsay, uh, the exception uh, toward the hearsay rule that applies to them is that it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So it's not an authenticity question, it's a hearsay objection. There's two theories uh, that all of these records come in under. One is the business records exception. Uh, the other is uh, the those records that the state is objecting to are not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, rather to explain the action or inaction of the Tysville Police Department. I really have no other argument to make other than that. Okay, but the defense believes that these are appropriate business records. No, I believe that they're admissible under the foundation that I've laid. Okay. They've been authenticated. Uh, I agree that there's some case law that would indicate some of those would not come in purely under business records, at the exception. Uh, because even though they are records that are kept in the regular course of business, uh, the business records does not provide a, a, a pathway for uh, inadmissible hearsay. However, if they're not hearsay, they're relevant, they're authenticated, they should come in. Anything further from the state? Um, it has to be, and if it was a regular practice of the activity to make such a memorandum, report, record, or data compil uh, compilation, all shown by the testimony, that is in relation to the people in the, in the business, 
that that avoids them having to all come in, which is the purpose of the of the exception. That's not what the part we're objecting to. That's not what um, is is happening here. And if you look at uh, the public records exception, there they specifically exclude police reports. So. Um, you know that's 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 my uh, position is that none of that, in my opinion, is admissible under business records that we've that we've had. One one of the records is a record that was completed by my office. All right. It appears there are 42 pages that are at issue. Um, I'm going to need to take a brief recess and review these and determine if they are admissible under the exception or not, and whether this um, composite will be introduced in some form or fashion. So I'll take another recess. I'll be back with you all as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. We are back on the record in case number 2012, CF 55504A, State of Florida versus William Woodward. I'll note the presence of Mr. Woodward at council table with Mr. Eisenmenger and Mr. Robinson, and the presence of Mr. Shiner on behalf of the state. All right, the court has had an opportunity to review Defense Exhibit P for identification, which were the records from the Titusville Police Department, in recognition that we had the records custodian testify yesterday. In regards to um, that predicate, I have had a chance to review the specific portions that the state is objecting to. And I'll just note that I originally um, I noted it was 42 pages. And Madam Clerk, there's a total of 170 pages? 160, excuse me. Um, so in reviewing that, first I'm modifying that to 43 simply because um, try to explain this best that I can. It was clipped together, but then there was one page that was stapled to the last offense report. So I think it's technically 43 pages that the state is objecting to. Um, I have had a chance to, again, specifically look at those, and these are three separate offense incident reports from Officer Brian Nelson, from Officer Tully Joyner, and from Officer Candia Roman. Those reports also contain and, and have attached to them various witness statements. Um, pursuant to Carter versus State, 951 Southern 2nd, 939, which again I cited earlier as a Fourth District Court of Appeal case, as well as <coughs> The Reichenberg versus Davis case, which is 846 Southern 2nd, 1233, it's a 5th District Court of Appeal case from 2003. Specifically, those cases are clear that witness statements, even though contained within the business records, do not fall within the exception. They're not based upon the personal knowledge of an agent of the business. So since those witness statements are part of those reports, I do not find that they meet uh, and fall within the business records exception. And I know the defense has argued that they're not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted as non-hearsay. The court finds otherwise. The defense argued that they were being offered to show the action or inaction of the Titusville Police Department, but those statements in no way show the actions or inactions of the agency, the Titusville Police Department specifically. So. I'm going to sustain the objection to those 43 pages of this composite exhibit and not allow these to be introduced. Um, with the party's permission, we probably should then just mark this as a separate exhibit to have it part of the record. Yes, I would request okay. that. Okay, so uh, what is the next defense exhibit? S. S, as in Sam? Yeah. Okay, so those will be a composite defense exhibit S, and otherwise, I will admit defense exhibit P, and are we on number three? Three with those 43 pages having re been removed based on the court's ruling. And again, I find that is hearsay contained within those offense reports that um, they're not simply designed to show lack of action or um, action taken by the Titusville Police Department. So um, 
At this point, how would the defense like to proceed? Are you ready to call your next witness? Can we call Kaylin Hill? All right, and the defense, um, excuse me, is the state ready to proceed as well? Yes, sir. All right, let's bring the jury back in then. Yes, sir. Please be seated. The jury is present in the courtroom once again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry for the brief delay in getting started, but I want to ensure that all of you followed my instructions during the overnight recess. Yes. yes. Is anyone aware of any violations of any of my instructions? No. no. All right. And uh, the defense would like to call Ms. Caitlin Hill. Okay. Bring in Ms. Hill, please. Good morning, ma'am. If you'd step to the podium, please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes, ma'am. All right. Please have a seat over here on the witness stand. Please state your full name. Caitlin Hill. Please spell your first and last names. Caitlin, C-A-I-T-L-I-N. Last name is H-I-L-L. Thank you. You may inquire. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hill, uh, I think you <clears throat> previously established your bona fides. Uh, in this case, you're a crime scene technician from the Tysville Police Department? Yes. Uh, if, <clears throat> I'd like to show you a couple of photographs. OK. Uh, for, uh, you may. For the record, I'm showing I don't remember if I was the one that took this photograph or not. Do you recognize the scene depicted? Yes. In the photograph. Uh, it does that fairly and accurately depict uh, the scene on the night of September 2nd through September, early morning hours, September 3rd? Yes. Okay. Uh, and can you briefly describe to the jury what the area of that scene this photograph depicts? Uh, this photograph is showing a portion of the carport in uh, 1940 Smith Drive, there is a, what appears to be a round uh, kitchen-like table with some chairs and objects on the table. Okay. And 1940, do you know what uh, one of, who's associated with living in that house, I guess? <coughs> I don't recall. You don't recall? Okay. Uh, I would offer a hand yeah. Any objection? Objection. Without objection, and will be number four in evidence for defense. <clears throat> First of all, do you recognize what's depicted in that particular photograph? Yes. Were you present uh, when those items were taken out of Mr. Hembry's pockets and arranged for that photograph? Yes. And who did that, actually? The medical examiner. Um, the forensic investigator from the medical examiner's office. Okay. But you were present and observed him doing that? Yes. And do those, uh, that <clears throat> photograph fairly and accurately depict the contents of Mr. Hembry's pockets uh, on the, in the early morning hours of September 3rd, 2012? Yes. I would seek to introduce that as my next time. Any objection? Okay. Without objection, defense O will be number five in evidence. Thank you. That's all the questions I have at this point. Cross-examination? No question. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Hill. Let me step down. Thank you. Hans is next witness. Uh, I'm going to introduce some exhibits. I'm showing okay. them to the state. Okay. All right. Then for the record, uh, in order, I would... Uh, introduce state, I mean, excuse me, defendant's exhibit F for identification as the defendant's next numbered exhibit. Number defendant. six, without objection. Defendant's exhibit G. Number seven, without objection. Defendant's exhibit J. Number eight, without objection. Defendant's exhibit K. Number nine, without objection. Defendant's exhibit L. Number 10, without objection. Defendant's Exhibit M. Number 11, without objection. And Defendant's Exhibit Q. 
Number 12, without objection. All of those have been introduced into evidence. I will publish those slightly later on. At this time, uh, we would call Officer Nelson. Officer Nelson. Okay. Officer Nelson, please. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. Next up to the podium, please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please have a seat over here on the witness stand. Thank you. <laughs> sir, if you'd please state your full name. It's Brian Nelson. Can you please spell your last name? N E L S O N. Thank you. You may inquire. Hey, good morning, Officer Nelson. Good morning, sir. Hey, who do you work for? Right now? I work for the Tynesville Police Department. And uh, back in uh, September, or August or September of 2012, who did you work for? I was still working for the Tynesville Police Department. And uh, at that point in time, were you familiar with uh, the Hembrys, the Pecores, the Blakes, and the Woodworths? I was. And, and how are you familiar with them? Uh, reference calls for service. And uh, how many times were you called out to uh, Smith Drive? regarding those individuals? Uh, calls specifically or uh, pre-planned calls? Um, calls relating to incidents. Um, I would say probably around 20. And uh, as uh, regarding those incidents, did you ever collect any uh, surveillance or video footage? Uh, I did not. Um, did you ever arrest anyone relating to those incidents? I did not make a physical arrest. Um, did you ever pass on the information that you learned from uh, these incidents to uh, your hire at Titusville Police Department? I did. Uh, do you know if Titusville Police Department ever took any action on the information? I believe they did. And what was that? I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear your response, sir. I believe they did. Thank I'm you. sorry. And uh, what was that action? Uh, we, pre we had pre-planned, um, pre-generated calls doing property checks, which is basically an area check of that location. Uh, to make sure the uh, the neighbors were staying civil with each other. Um, and were you ever instructed by a superior to contact the state attorney's office regarding to try to mediate the dispute that was going on at that location? I do not recall that. Have a moment, Your Honor. You may. <clears throat> I have nothing further. Cross-examination? Attorneys may approach. Cross examination. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Um, you had an occasion to respond to this particular area on August 5th, 2012. Isn't that right? I did. <clears throat> and that was a call for service that came out from the Hembry's house. That was the second call for that day. So you came out once before involving the theft from the porch, right? Uh, that I did. And you talked to both parties? I did. Okay. And then you left? I did. And then you received another call that the defendant, Mr. Woodward, was now in the streets trying to bait Mr. Hembry out to fight him? Is that that right? is correct. And you responded? I did. Okay. Now you said on direct examination that you didn't physically make an arrest. What do you mean by that? Um, we have different options as law enforcement. The uh, In that case, uh, regarding the, the second incident on August 5th, uh, I wrote a summons, which is basically uh, I wrote charges for Mr. Woodward and to be filed with the state attorney's office so they could review the case to proceed with the charges. And, and that was done? That was completed. What the, the other incidents that you were called to respond to this particular area, every time you were called, did you respond? Every time that I was called, yes, I did respond. And you recalled any other specific instances that you responded? The majority of incidents that I responded to were basically uh, just verbal disturbances, which is basically uh, arguing between the neighbors. Okay. Both sides? Uh, that is correct. And each time you came out, you instructed both sides to? To go their separate ways. They, um, they lived on the corner. Uh, they both lived at the corner houses on Smith Drive. So there was, uh, I would just separate them and make sure that they were, they remained in their property to, to avoid confrontation. 
Nothing further. Redirect? You know, let's talk about the, uh, um, the capius you sent up to uh, the state attorney's office. Um, so now you arrived on scene and you spoke to all the witnesses. That is correct. And, uh, and that was Gary Hembury. He was there? Uh, that is correct. Um, Roger McCor? That is correct. Uh, Kerry Blake? I believe so. Lady named Crystal Hale. I believe so. Uh, Kim Cast. Yes, sir. So with, uh, I think I said Bruce Blake, but if not. Bruce Blake, yes, sir. Uh, you spoke with Barbara Woodward. I believe so. Uh, you spoke with uh, Jeffrey Scott Crow. That is correct. You spoke with uh, Lydia Crow. That is correct. You spoke with uh, William Woodward Sr. That is correct. Now, after interviewing those, those individuals, why why did you not arrest Mr. Woodward? There was a discrepancy within the statements, um, and based on that reason, and there was no physical evidence. Uh, Mr. Woodward was not carrying a firearm at the time of uh, my contact, and, uh, and the discrepancy within the statements, I couldn't. And you say discrepancy within the statements. The discrepancy was between uh, the Hembrys, the Bacores, and the Blakes, correct? That is correct. And uh, the discrepancy was whether he had a firearm, we did with the firearm. Uh, there was one, one person that said that uh, they believed that he had a firearm but did not actually see it. Uh, just different descriptions of what the firearm they saw was. Um, now, you sent that case up to the state attorney's office. That is correct. Uh, but they did not file, but you sent it up as an exhibition of a firearm. That is correct. And that means that somebody basically showed a firearm, correct? That is correct. But that is not the charge that was actually filed. I'm not sure what the charge the state attorney's office had filed. Well, uh, was it in fact disorderly conduct? I do not recall. Are you familiar with the charge of disorderly conduct? Are you familiar with disorderly conduct? Yes, sir, I am. Yeah, and that charge does not include a firearm, does it? It does not. May I have a moment, Your Honor? You may. Uh, are you aware if that charge was ever null prost dropped? Are you, at, you're, are you asking I'm if the charge like that is the disorderly conduct? Was that charge later dropped? Uh, specifically for Mr. Woodward? Yes. I, I do not know that information. There was no discrepancy in the statements that Mr. Woodward was trying to fight Mr. Hembry, though, right? I don't believe so. No, nothing further. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, ma'am. You may step down. Lydia Crow, please. Good morning, ma'am. You please step to the podium and please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. All right, please have a seat over here on the witness stand. If you would please state your full name. Lydia Irene Gallagher Crow. And if you could spell your first and last names. L Y D I A. G A L L A G H E R C R O W. Thank you. You may inquire. Hi, uh, ma'am. First of all, uh, back in 2012, um, basically August, September 2012, where did you reside? 1216 South Park Avenue. <coughs> Who were your neighbors? Uh, Billy Woodward, Barbara Woodward, Ava Woodward, um, Ethan Woodward, the Hembrys. Now, were you a witness to an incident on or about August 5th, 2012? Yes. When did you actually come forward to witness that? I was, uh, I'm a little nervous. That's okay. Um, I was 
in our backyard and I heard a commotion uh, down the street um, on Smith Avenue and um, I went to the corner of my yard to look and see what was going on. And what did you see? I saw um, Gary Hembry and, and Billy Woodward in the street arguing. Okay. Now, what did you do? Did you ever get closer to that or did you just remain in that vantage point? I just remained in my backyard. Okay. Were you clearly able to see what was going on from that vantage point? Yes. About how far away were you? 50 feet, approximately. Did there come a point in time during your observations where Mr. Woodward did something to demonstrate whether or not he possessed a weapon? Yes. What did he do? Could you describe that to the jury? He lifted his shirt and he turned all the way around to show that he was not, did not have a weapon. Any kind of weapon? Any kind of weapon. More particularly, he didn't have a firearm. Right. And you could clearly see that? Yes. And you could see that the context of what he was doing was to tell the Hembrys picky orders. Same. Was the context of that to show any particular group that he was not unarmed? Yes, he was showing the the Hembrys that and the pick. Based on your observation. Same. Who was he directing these comments at when he was showing that he was unarmed? Uh, Mr. Hembry and uh, Roger Picure and uh, that group of people. <laughs> and how close do they were they to Mr. Woodward when he was demonstrating that he was unarmed? Less than 20 feet, I would say approximately. Anything impeding their view of this? No. Anything that would keep them from clearly seeing that he was unarmed. No. Now, on that particular occasion, did you uh, hear any threats or obscenities directed toward Mr. Woodward uh, or his family? Yes, they were just calling him names and things like that. When you say they, who is directing these comments toward Mr. Woodward? The Hembrys, Picure, and the Blakes. Now, you actually were called to testify as to this incident at an injunction hearing, is that correct? Yes. Were you allowed to present your testimony? No. Were you prepared to testify as you had testified here today? Yes. <clears throat> now, in between this, was that the first incident uh, where you had seen any sort of uh, threats, obscenities, et cetera, directed by the Picky or Hembry Blake group toward the Woodwards? Yes. Okay. After that, did you uh, observe any conduct of that nature on subsequent occasions? Yes, constantly. What do you mean by constantly? Every day, all day long, into the night, late into the night, every day, constantly, from about the 5th till the, that night. Did you ever see uh, Mr. Woodward ever initiate any of these unpleasant trees? No, not that I saw. So everything that you observed was initiated by the other group? Yes. Now, were the police ever, <clears throat> well, let me back up. Were you ever subjected to any of that kind of behavior by this group? Yes. May I have the attorney's approach, please? The question is, were you and your husband ever subjected to any of this sort of conduct by this <coughs> Henry Picky or Blake group? Yes. And was, <coughs> from the nature of the comments to you, was it directed at you because of your willingness to testify on? Please. May I finish my question, please? Oh, I still get to finish my question. It's improper to. Let me hear the question. Thank you. Were these comments directed towards you because of your willingness to testify on behalf of the Woodwards? Sustained. 
from the comments that were directed to you, what was your impression of why they were How did it make you feel? As a result of this, did you arm yourself? Yes. <clears throat> How many times did you call the police yourself? At least a dozen times, probably more. Did the police ever take any action to intervene on your behalf? No. Did you observe different instances when the police were called uh, because of conduct that was directed against the Woodward family? Yes. How many times did you personally observe that? Probably 20 to 30 times at least. And did you ever see the police take any action to intervene on behalf of the Woodwards? No. Did you ever receive any communications from this group regarding your willingness to testify? Yes, they had told us, you know, that we needed to Next question. Were any specific threats directed at you? Yes. As of that? What were the nature of those threats? After these threats, <clears throat> did you do anything specifically in response to these threats? Yes, I started carrying a gun with me when I went outside, specifically at night when I went out to take my dogs out to go to the bathroom in my own fenced backyard. I felt that threatened, even in my fenced yard, that I needed to carry a gun because of the threats that were made against me and my family. Had you ever done that before? No. Now, after the injunction hearing, did things get better or worse? No, they just escalated. Was it 50-50, Mr. Woodward, you know, initiating this, or was it more one-sided? It was all one-sided on their part. Now, let me expand that. Uh, I mean, based on your observations, were any other body else in the Woodward family, his wife, his children, his mother, his father, ever initiating or directing any comments? No, not that I saw. How about the children of the Henry Blake Picior family? Were they involved in this? Yes. To what extent? On numerous occasions that they would... On one occasion that I, I witnessed, I witnessed one of the little girls from, I believe it was the Blake's little girls, that um, they said to, they called Barbara a bitch okay. did, from across the street. And if, did their parents ever intervene or did they encourage them? They would whisper in their ears to tell them to say things. That is all I have of this witness at this time, though I would ask that you be available for recall. Okay. Cross-examination? Yes. Okay. You recognize the aerial uh, image? Yes. Okay. Now, is your home somewhere in this Yes. Um, this. I believe the park is over here. Okay. Trying to get my Mr. bearings Woodward, here. That's... Right. Our home is back here. Okay. So you're back here? Yes. So <clears throat> is your home would have been behind the Woodward home? Yes. On fronting on Park Avenue? Yes. Okay. And location of your backyard is directly behind Billy's backyard, the okay. Woodward's backyard. Well, is it visible in this image? <clears throat> okay. We were talking earlier about that the 
witness table, can you show the jury the area your residence would be? I think we can see part of the roof underneath the untitled map. Yes, right, right there. Okay, now is, is that your roof there below an untitled map? Is that where the house was actually set on the property? Yes. Okay, now where was your fence line? Our fence line was probably right there. Sorry, a little shaky. That's okay. So, did it run the whole way along the back and separate you, your house from Mr. Woodward's house? Yes. Right. Now, this um, on, on this August 5th day, 2012, um, on that date where there's some chickens in the backyard of Mr. Woodward? Yes. How many chickens were back there? Probably 18, 20, right around there. All right. Um, now, had... Um, had you seen the police come out earlier that day? Earlier on the 5th? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, had uh, you seen, uh, so where were you when you supposedly saw this argument, discussion? I was right at the... Debate. the corner right there by fence okay. in Billy's backyard. And where were these people? They were... And I'm talking about Mr. Woodward. Right about here, I would say. Okay. Now, you know where Mr. Uh, Hembry's driveway is? Yes. Okay. And that's a little bit farther down. Yes. Are you able to see over there from your, from your vantage point? His driveway? Yeah. I can see the end of his driveway, yes. Okay. So you can actually... Um, now, how tall is your fence? It's only four foot. It's okay. chain link. And it's a chain link fence? Yeah. Okay. I understand. So um, so you were able to position yourself where you could see in front of Mr. Hembry's residence on Smith Drive? Yes. Was Mr. Hembry standing in his yard? He was at the end of his driveway. Okay. So he was, was he, was he on his property? I believe so. All right. Did uh, the defendant uh, ask him to come out and fight him on the, on the street? He was asking for the present back. The what? Ava's birthday present back. He was asking for Ava's birthday present back. Okay, so what you were, what you were seeing was a police officer there? No, not at that time. Okay, so let me see if I understand this. You're saying that what you observed is Mr. Uh, Mr. Woodward over at the Hembry residence, and he was asking for his birthday present back without a police officer. Yes. Okay. Was he asking Mr. Hembry to fight him? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, did he uh, tell the women there that he was going to disembowel them? Not that I heard. Now, were you... Um, you said you were present at the injunction here. Yes. Um, and when did you leave? I know you didn't get to testify, but when did you leave? Uh, the same time as uh, Billy Woodward, Barbara, okay. Ann and Bill Woodward, my husband, did you, did Marty you, and Larry Moulton. Did you watch Mr. Woodward attack Mr. Hembry at his car? I did see that. So he went over to where Mr. Hembry was and attacked him in his, at his call, right? They were supposed to have left 15 minutes before. The bailiff had said... Well, was that my question? Was that my question? Yes, I did see that. All right. Because it wasn't my question, was it? Sustained. Are you trying to make excuses for what happened? Sustained. So, you saw him run across, and I'm talking about Mr. Woodward, 
run across the street and physically attack Mr. Hembree. Did you not? I did. Okay. And someone had to come up with pepper spray to get him to stop. Did they not? Yes. Now, was Mr. Hembree trying to get away and into his vehicle? No. All right, before we proceed with the state's next question, ladies and gentlemen, let me again advise you that the evidence you're about to receive concerning other crimes, wrongs, or acts allegedly committed by the defendant will be considered by you for the limited purpose of proving motive, intent, or ill will, and you shall consider it only as it relates to those issues. However, the defendant is not on trial for a crime, wrong, or act that is not included in the indictment. You may continue, Mr. Russell. All right. So, uh, the did you leave uh, after law enforcement got involved in that situation, or did you stay? We left. Was, was the, let, let's go back just to the hearing, the hearing situation itself. Would you describe that, that situation as tense? Yes. And uh, after this happened at the courthouse, the situation with Mr. Woodward and Mr. Henry, um, I didn't see him pull in, no. Did you observe the Blake and the Henry and the teacher of Ford <laughs> home is, come home from this? Uh, they were in their yard. And were people upset after that? I would say so. I'm talking about on your observation. Yes. You were upset, did you not? Yes. <clears throat> now, Sunday, I guess it was the following Sunday going into Monday, um, there was a party over at the uh, Blake's in the Hembury. Yes. Not? Are you aware of that? Yes. You could hear it. Yes. What time did you go to bed? Probably around 9 30, 10 o'clock. Now, this was a Sunday going into a Labor Day Monday, right? Yes. So, uh, you don't know or did not see or observe anything that happened from the time there on 9 30 on? I did not see, I heard. The music and the screaming and hollering. Okay. Now, did you actually hear the shooting? No. Did you, um, after you became aware there was a shooting, did you contact Sparkle? Uh, I did. I did. Did you call the police? I did not. Redirect? Yep. Uh, let me talk about the aftermath of the injunction since the state brought it up. Okay. <clears throat> How was Mr. Hembree acting uh, just prior uh, to Mr. Woodward getting physically involved with him? He yelled something across the street as we were leaving the courthouse as if to uh, antagonize Billy. Yeah. How about 
even before, you indicated that the court deputy had sort of separated you all and asked there to be a staggered leaving. Is that yes. correct? Yes, it was tense, and so the bailiff had uh, ordered for them, the Hembury crowd, to leave the courtroom 15 minutes before us. We had to wait, and so that way, you know, everybody went their own separate ways, and, and that's not what happened. Gary and Kim had stayed behind, and they were out by their car, and when we came down the courthouse steps, Gary yelled something at Billy, and... and Billy reacted to it. Really, he reacted. I mean, after what had happened, the judge dismissing it like he did, that we should go home and play nice like we're in church, and not really um, listening to anything anybody had to say, any of the witnesses or what the police officers had to say. So, you know, it, he, was, he was upset. We all were. Now, you had indicated that you actually, after all of this, when you returned home, uh, the Henry Picure Blake's gang was out in their yard. What were they doing? I think they were waiting for Billy to get home. Okay, and what did they do when that happened? I wasn't out there at the exact time, but I know from then on the, the threats and taunts and screaming and horn honking just went up from there. It just escalated. It was constant after that. Okay. Now, you had indicated to the state that um, you were aware of their quote-unquote party uh, what was some of the entertainment of the party that you personally heard? They were trying to get Billy to come out, and um, they were saying, come on out, you army reject. Uh, get out here. Let's settle this now. Uh, just those kinds of things, threatening to do harm to them, to burn their house down, things like of that nature. How did that make you feel? I was scared. I, I just, I, I felt like things were just really getting worse. Did you believe that they were capable of carrying out the threats that they were making? Yes. Any doubt in your mind? No doubt in my mind. Thank you. Things like that, I, as far as I know. Yes. I believe that's what I heard. Yes. The screaming was very loud, sir. Okay. So the answer to that is yes. yes. You clearly heard that. Yes, yes, I clearly heard a lot of things in my house. I do not. No. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. You may step down. You are subject to recall, ma'am, but you may be excused this time. Scott Crow, please. Good morning, sir. If you would stand, morning. please step to the podium. Please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Please have a seat over here on the witness stand. If you would please state your full name. Uh, Jeffrey Scott Crow. And please spell your last name. C R O W. Good morning, Mr. Crow. Good morning. Now, in uh, August and September of uh, 2012, uh, you were neighbors with the Woodward's, correct? Yes, sir. And um, so you were familiar with the Woodward family? Yes, sir. And did you also know the Pecores, the Hembrys, and the Blakes? Yes, sir, I did. And uh, who were they? Uh, they were the neighbors that were, from my advantage, if I look back at Billy's house, across the street on the left on the corner. So they were a house down and then across the street? Uh, not a house down. 
Billy lived directly behind me, and he was across the street from Billy's. And I want to direct you to uh, August 5th, 2012. Does that you know, bring an incident uh, back in your mind? I believe that was the first day, the incident. And um, is that an incident that you witnessed? Yes, sir. And describe for us exactly what you witnessed. My wife and I were sitting out in the backyard, and we heard arguments. You know, there was always conversation back and forth through the neighborhood, but this day was different. Uh, we heard some yelling, and we were sitting in the back portion of the yard where we could kind of see Billy out in the street. And we heard, basically, it sounded like it was escalating. And we heard Gary say, come on over if you want to fight. And we thought, hey, at first they were joking, but you could tell by the frame of the voices on both sides that something serious had happened. And all we picked up was, uh, basically, it was something about a present. And uh, they were just very loud towards each other. Now, when you say Gary, you meant uh, Gary Hembry? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, the loud voices that you heard, who was that? It was uh, Gary Hembry and um, Billy Woodward. And, um, and they were having an argument over a present? From what we understood, yes. I uh, heard the word present, that he wanted it back, and uh, it just kind of escalated from there. Now, did you ever see Mr. Woodward flash a weapon? Never. Uh, from where you were standing, did you see Mr. Woodward clearly? We had a clear view. And um, did you ever see him pull up his shirt? Yes, I did. And uh, he spun around. If I remember right, they said, Billy, you better not have a weapon. And he said, I do not have a weapon. He pulled his shirt up. And when he said I didn't have a weapon, we were curious and walked up to the fence. And he pulled his shirt above his head and spun around. And there was no weapon at all. Um, and after he spun around, Describe first what happened. Could you clarify that? So you said Mr. Woodward spun around. Yes, sir. And then what happened? Then they pretty much went back to arguing again. Now, you mentioned that you were um, familiar with uh, the Hembrys, the Blakes, and the Picors. Yes, sir. And um, they lived in two houses, is that correct? Yes. And. Um, other than uh, you know, Roger Picor, Gary Hembury, and um, Bruce Blake. Thank you, yeah, Tim Blake. Um, who else? Uh, who else were, were you familiar with that lived in those households? Uh, pretty much all of them. I didn't know the children. I know that it was uh, Kim was living there with Gary. I know that Carrie lived with Blake. They were married, and uh, Jessica Nobles. She was Roger's girlfriend. And so when you say Kim, you mean Kim Cast? Uh, yes. And yes. that was Kerry Blake? Um, yes, that's right. Now, other than what we spoke about on August 5th, did you ever witness any, any harassment by those group of individuals against the Woodward family? Prior to this? Uh, you know, other than that August 5th incident we spoke about. Oh, yeah. I mean, from August 5th to basically Labor Day, it was constant. And, and describe for us what that harassment looked like. Uh, the best way to describe it, it was just hours and hours of harassment. Um, like I said, we sat behind, and from our vantage point, we could see all of Billy's side yard, and all of uh, pretty much Gary's yard. And the harassment would be uh, basically pointed at individuals. Uh, at first, it wasn't too bad. After we had a court situation, it got worse. Uh, but they were threatening him. Uh, they would get children to call Barbara a bitch when she walked her dog. And that basically whisper in the ears, and you know that's where it came from because it was whisper. Then you hear these kids yell that. They had threatened to kill Billy on a couple occasions and kill his children and his family, and that bothered us quite a bit. And when you say they, who was that? It basically was like a gang mentality. It could be any of them. Most of the time, it was like uh, Roger, Kerry, uh, Gary. Now, did you ever see Mr. Woodward start or instigate any harassment? Or no, never. Now, you live with Lydia Crowe. Yes, my wife. She's your wife. Now, were you all ever the subject of any harassment by this gang of people? Yeah, it was uh, not at first. It was mostly after we went down to get a restraining order, 
and Gary and Bruce and the whole gang realized that we were there to testify against them. And from that point on, it was pretty much on with them. Uh, if we walked out in the yard, we were the subject of their attack verbally, and uh, it wouldn't end unless we really went back inside. And um, and you say subject, you know, attacks verbally. What, what were those attacks? Uh, basically, what I hate to say words like that. Just basically, what are we looking at? What are you doing? You know, looking this way. Um, uh, it's very important that you're very frank with everybody today. Basically, what the hell are you looking at? You know, it's kind of hard not to look at someone when they're screaming vulgarities across the street because you're half curious and half the time we were out there, we just wanted to make sure that we weren't, how do you put it? Uh, we were, my wife and my daughter were very fearful of this group and we wanted to know what was going on with them at all times. We didn't want to get caught off guard. We were as scared as Billy and their family was and quite a few of the neighbors were too. And uh, we wanted to keep aware of the situation so that if it did turn against us, that we were, you know, ready to run inside or call the police. And uh, you said you were scared. Were there any threats made against you or your family? Two to three times they had threatened to kill us, uh, threatened to kill my daughter, threatened to kill my wife, and threatened to kill myself. And uh, as a result of those threats, were you and your family in fear? You were, were you and your family in fear? Yes. Yeah. And uh, what steps did you take? Well, we called the police, and the police came out to our house, took our statement, and they told us there was nothing they could do. And I said, uh, Officer, I thought if someone had threatened to kill your life, your family, your child, that uh, you could do something, talk to them, put a restraining order, maybe even arrest them. And we were told it was freedom of speech. And I said, you're kidding me. I said, they threatened to kill my daughter. And they said, there's nothing we can do. We did not hear it. And this country is freedom of speech. And it still doesn't sound right to me, but they walked off. How many times do you think that uh, you called uh, law enforcement? My wife and I had probably called at least a dozen times. And out of those, those reports, did anything ever come of them? No, that was the scary part. Every time we called for our own protection or at least maybe intervene and get them to quiet down and stop screaming at us, screaming at Billy, there's nothing they could do. They told us they couldn't do anything unless something happened. And that was not what I thought the police were there for. And, and when you, and they said they couldn't do anything unless something happened, like what did you take that Violence. Uh, someone had to be hurt. Uh, someone had to be threatened with a weapon. Something had to happen physically before they could intervene. And that scared me because I didn't want to wait to that point. You know? So you took that to mean that you couldn't take any action or couldn't, you know, law enforcement couldn't take any action until one of that gang hurt you or your family. Yes, sir. That's what we took from it. Now, as a result of this, did you ever arm yourself? Yes, sir, we did. And um, <coughs> did your wife arm herself? Yes, sir, she did. Now, you you had you'd mentioned being at a, uh, I think you called it a restraining order. You repeat that first one? I think you'd mentioned that you had been at a restraining order. Yes, sir, we were. And um, why were you there? Because of the incident that I told you about a while ago with Billy pulling up his shirt, we were there to testify that they had said he had a weapon when he did not. And Billy wanted to get a restraining order to protect them from the all afternoon, all night screaming and uh, any chance at all that they may take action. And we were there with neighbors and a few police officers to testify on Billy's behalf. And was anybody allowed to testify? <laughs> no, sir. Uh, basically, uh, Billy came back in the courtroom. He was... Uh, very shocked and upset that the uh, judge basically wouldn't hear from the neighbors that showed up. So, you know, unless you actually witnessed something and saw it, um, you can't testify to that. Okay. So, but. Okay. So now you can't talk about what uh, Mr. Woodward said. But were you able to see Mr. Woodward's reaction? Yes, he was. Uh, Describe that for us, please. He just came in and uh, sat down. He was quiet. He didn't say a word. We were kind of wondering why he had come back so soon from the judge's office because we figured it would take probably half an hour, especially with him and the police officers. And uh, I think I had talked to Bill or his wife, Barbara, and asked, you know, what happened, and they explained.
Well, again, you know, you can't talk about what somebody else said, but you can talk about, you know, what you witnessed. And witness. how, how was the family? How did, you, how did you observe the reaction of the family? Um, upset, shocked, and they seemed to be very nervous because what they had come to, to do there that day was turned down, and we were on our own after that point. Now, did you witness the, the, the Pecors, the Hembrys, and the Blakes after the injunction hearing? Uh, yes, they're directly afterwards. And, and describe for us, you know, what were they doing after the hearing? Can you repeat that again? You know, how did they act? At the hearing or after the hearing? At, oh, how about at the hearing? At the <laughs> it was the wildest thing we ever ran into. We came up the stairs of the courthouse to testify, and they were all sitting on um, well, these kind of seats, like church pushed seats. And they were saying things as we went by, and that's when the bailiff stepped in and asked everybody with the Woodward Party to go into the courtroom and sit separate from Gary's side and uh, just basically keep us separated because he could tell there was it was intense and kind of a lot of animosity there. And I wasn't aware that it would be that uh, intense of a situation going down to do this. And then when you returned home after the injunction hearing, or the, the Hembrys, Bacores, everybody, were they out front of their house? You know, I honestly couldn't tell you that. I had taken the day off of work, and I had to be at work immediately afterwards. I dropped off my wife, and I went directly to work. Now, after the hearing, did the harassment and threats by the Hembrys, Bacores, and Blakes get better or get worse? <laughs> it intensified. Um, the feeling I got is, um, how would you put this, that... They weren't going to be accountable for it from that point on since the judge basically said to go home. And what happened every night went from being a little bit scary to becoming terrifying because it had doubled, tripled the amount of vulgarities, the threats, the uh, intensity of the shouting. And as time went on, did that just get worse? Oh, yes. And it accumulated every day. And how did that affect you and your family? <laughs> Well, it's terrifying. I, I work in Melbourne, so I'm about an hour away from work. And I did not want to go to home at nighttime because every time I got home, which was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, just several hours after I went to bed, they were still outside there screaming. But at the same time, I knew that my wife and my daughter were terrified of them. And I wanted to get home for their safety as soon as I could because I really didn't know what kind of frame of mind they were going to be in that day. And I did not want to leave my family unprotected. No. After the junction hearing, how did the Pecors, uh, Hembrys, and Blakes act against the Woodwards? It was worse because basically um, the feeling that you got was um, there was going to be no protection to whatever they wanted to say, whatever they wanted to do was okay. And we pretty much knew after the police being out there 30 times and saying there's nothing they could do that no one was going to be accountable. You have a moment, Your Honor? You may. Questions, John. May proceed. Um, so, Mr. Crow, uh, after the injunction, did you witness an incident between uh, Mr. Woodward and Mr. Hembury? I did. And, and uh, describe that for us. Well, it was bad in the courtroom at the time. Um, the bailiff had came and told Hembury and uh, the whole gang to go ahead and leave. And you have 15 minutes to leave. And he pointed at us and says, you're not to go anywhere for 15 minutes. I want to keep you two apart. And, I, and then he said to them, I expect you to be gone by the time they leave. So it was about 15, maybe 17 minutes later that we actually left the second floor of the courtroom in Titusville and walked down to the street. Billy was probably about from where I am to you ahead of me. And uh, Gary was uh, standing outside of his car. And he said something to Billy. And Billy basically just snapped. He went over there and started beating up on Gary. But it was strange because Gary had his window rode down. As soon as Billy came up to him, he stuck his hands inside the car. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. Someone's attacking me. I would be defending myself. But Gary put his hands on the horn and just held his horn down while Billy just basically fumbled him. But at the same time, Kim, which was his girlfriend, jumped out of the car and held her camera up. Apparently, she was filming this. And afterwards, you know, I figured out it looked to me like a setup because why would you say something to someone when you're supposed to be gone already and lay on the horn and your girlfriend film the whole event? So, thank you. Can have a moment, Your Honor? You may. I have no further questions, Your Honor. 
cross-examination. Okay. So you were in your backyard on August 5th? I'll be honest with you, days I don't remember. Are we talking about the day of the incident? Well, on August 5th of 2012, mm -hmm. I believe so. I believe that was August 5th would be the incident day. But okay. Well, August 5th, uh, why would you call that an incident? Because that is when uh, Billy had the present stolen. That's when this okay. incident started. So, so you blurred that from the Woodwards? That's what that was about? No, sir. I watched it in the street. That's what the argument was about that day. Please, I want my daughter's present back. Right. Was there a police officer there? Yeah, he showed up about uh, half an hour after this point. Okay. So your testimony is that there was a conflict, and then the police were called, and then the police officer. Yes, sir. Um, and you're sure you were able to hear? Yes, sir. Okay. The reason was, sir, is that during this time, there wasn't talking like this. It was shouting. Everything was done with the shout. Now, the, where was this disagreement? Show me a picture or just describe it. Okay. Yes, sir. Right there between uh, the two residences? Yes, sir. All right. Who was there? Uh, Billy and uh, Gary. I think there may have been some others, but the only ones I really concentrated was the two voices that were yelling. All right. And where was uh, Mr. Hembry? Was he in his yard or was he? Mr. Hembry was right about there. He was just on the other side of the sidewalk. All right. And where was uh, Mr. Woodward? We call people by their last name. Right there. All right. So he was in. Now, and uh, so the dispute you're talking about was about a press. Yes, sir. From what I got from the conversation. Okay. <laughs> um, was there anything that your neighbor would have kept in his backyard? That would be the chickens. I believe it was for the before the injunction date, or just after. It was just a couple of days before or after that. Okay. Now, what are you thinking this injunction date is? That would have been. It was um, basically almost one week prior to the shooting, so it would be around the 27th of September. All right. Was it was it midweek? If I remember right, it was a Monday. Yes, it's five years ago. The best of my memory, it was earlier in the week. All right. And by early Sunday, uh, well, early Monday morning, this, this shooting happened, right? For the following week, yes. By the weekend. That is the, it's that weekend that this happened, the following weekend. Yeah, the following weekend, correct. All right. So whenever during that week the injunction That is correct. Now, um, I thought I heard your testimony that um, there wasn't any antagonism expressed to you or your wife until you showed up at this injunction. Is that true? Is that what you testified to? 
best of my memory, I think it pretty much happened from that point on. Okay. So whenever the injunction hearing, it would have been those several days that that conversation was pointed in your direction. Yes, sir. Now, uh, the uh, situation had, well, well, let me ask you this. When yes, sir. You saw, when you saw Mr. Woodward out in the street, <coughs> Was he calling Mr. Hembree to come out into the street so he could find him? The worst of my memory um, was that he wanted his pre damn present back now. And I believe there's words on both sides. If you want to fight, we'll fight. Come on my yard. And he says, we can fight. Something to this extent. It was like a mutual, but nothing ever came about from that. But the words that they were going to fight did come out. Okay. That, that's what you recall today. That's your impression. Yes. Is, is there was discussions about fighting between the two of them. There was comments from Gary, if you want to fight, come on over to my yard and we'll do it now. And he said, I can, you know, basically. Okay, so, well, okay, so Henry was saying, come, come into the yard. Yes, that was his words, if I remember right. You know, at the time, I remember the two of them because it was so loud, and that's why you're concentrating on the two individuals. But after it was over with, before the police came, um, there was other people there. And I really, I remember at least one or two other adults when the police came, maybe three. But who was on hand at the time of the argument, I don't remember other than Gary and Billy. And you were in a good position to see whether or not Mr. Woodward had weapons on his person? Billy was, Billy was right there, and I was right there, okay. 20, 20 feet. Right. And um, did you see, while he didn't have weapons, that he had uh, sheaths or holsters? I saw one knife sheet, but I didn't notice there was no knife in it. Yes. Now, you did see Mr. Woodward on, after the injunction hearing, attack Mr. Henry, did you not? I did, sir. And that's the only person you saw attack anybody in this dispute. Is that true? Well, you mean in this incident? I'm talking about or all together. August, August 5th on, did you ever see anyone physically attack anyone besides? No, sir. Not that I can remember. this attack had happened. It got worse, right? It did. Did you notice that the, the police were regularly driving by the neighborhood? They were being called out very often. Routine patrols to the neighborhood. I didn't really notice. It wasn't until the last couple of days that uh, did we see once or twice a day a police car come through prior to this when we called them or when the other side called them. Did the police always respond to the call? I mean, was there a time they never showed up? Yeah. Not that I remember. Did they show up often? No, sir. Anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 minutes from my memory. Yes. The uh, night is actually the night going into the morning. 
Yes, sir. Which is uh, Sunday, September 2nd. Yes, sir. We went in the house at 8, about 9 o'clock. We sat and watched TV. Uh, probably about 11, 15, 11, 30, we fell asleep. Okay. And uh, you said that you were uh, watching or listening to what was going on outside? The uh, window in my room faces Billy's house and over that way, and we weren't watching, but we heard almost everything that was said. You could hear it over the TV. Okay. Um, did you, uh, were you, were you asleep and something happened and woke you up, or were you awake when the shooting started? I had basically just gone to sleep, probably about 20 minutes when the shooting woke me. So, uh, Mr. Crow, on uh, August 5th, 2012, yes, sir. to clarify, there was a argument that occurred first, and that was a president, right? Yes, sir. And um, I'm just trying to get to the point, Your Honor. So, after that argument, uh, was law enforcement called? Yes, sir. Did law enforcement come out to the scene? They did. And uh, how long did they stay? Half an hour to 45 minutes, I think. And then what did they do? Basically, uh, it is. What happened was police showed up, and we heard uh, Kim or uh, Carrie walk up to the corner and say he had a gun. And that's when my wife and I looked at each other and said he didn't have a gun. So we walked down to, we were right there when we heard this, and we walked right there where the police officer was, and we explained to him that uh, Billy had taken the time to pull up his shirt and spin around, and he proved that he didn't have a gun on him. And he says, are you willing to sign an affidavit? And we told him, yes, sir, definitely, because that's what we saw. So we signed the affidavit with the police officer. Now, after uh, law enforcement left that day, were there any other incidents? With the police or between the two? Or just between you and the Hembrees and the Vicors or the, the Woodwards and the Vicors? There was uh, a few incidents between us and them. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. There answer. was a few instances that we had. So, prior to the the fight, had there been another incident that you were aware of? Can you tell me? What? So prior to the, you know, that time, that incident, you spoke with, with law enforcement. Yes. Had they been out earlier that day? Are you aware of that? No, sir, because what had happened was we had witnessed it from the time they were screaming at each other to 30 minutes later when the police showed up. So the comment was made about the gun, and that's when we walked down and talked to the police officer. Prior to this, we hadn't really heard anything, no. And um, you testified on cross that uh, you never saw the, you know, him or or anybody else ever attack anyone. Um, did that ever lessen your fear of them? <laughs> no, no. Did you fear that this gang was somewhat more adept at dealing with these types of incidents? You could tell by the nature of the individuals what type of people they were, uh, people that I haven't really dealt with before in the past. And uh, they had made it very clearly what their thoughts were and how they felt and what they could do. And I truly believed them. So, like I said, I was afraid for my family, so every day I'd hustle home. They weren't going to be there unprotected, especially the evening, because from about the late afternoon, at least from what I experienced, late afternoon until late at night, maybe 11 or 12, they were at it. 
they were threatening and uh, a few times my wife had gone outside with the dog to let the dog out and comments would be made towards her. And then late at night when she let the dogs out, we made sure that she had a weapon on her and I would normally escort her out too. Thank you. Thank you. One more we on? Any recross? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay. I might just miss where I come back in. You may step down and okay, you may be excused. Okay, thank you. The attorneys may approach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a brief restroom stretch break. So if you would leave your notebooks on the chairs, make sure that you follow my instructions during our 10 minute recess. Thank you. All right. All right, please be seated. We are back on the record in case number 2012-CF55504A, State of Florida versus William Woodward. I'll note the presence of Mr. Woodward at council table with Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Robinson, and the presence of Mr. Rasmus and Mr. Shiner on behalf of the state. Uh, would the defense like to call one more witness before lunch? Okay. But I did allow them to remain here, just noting that for the record. Supplemental to zero by objection. Okay, so noted. Anything else we need to address before we bring the jury back in? Okay, let's bring the jury back in, please. And I'm sorry, the name of the witness was Huntington? We probably yeah. should address that as okay. time as the presence right. of the Can jury. Can you um, wait for a moment, Deputy? <coughs> right, please be seated. Um, he may not be that quick of a witness uh, if they're going to be objecting. We're offering Mr. Huntington's testimony, and I'll quickly proffer it. I believe Mr. Huntington is going to testify uh, that at or around um, <coughs> August uh, 2012, uh, that on a couple of different occasions, uh, he had conversations with both uh, Bruce, Timoth Bruce Timothy Blake and Carrie Blake uh, regarding uh, their intention to um, engage in what they characterize as a form of entertainment, drink beer and fuck with their neighbor. Uh, we believe that it is evidence of a conspiracy to commit the crime of aggravated <coughs> stalking. We believe that it's commissions against interest uh, between parties that are engaged in uh, a conspiracy to uh, commit aggravated stalking. And we believe that this goes in furtherance of proof that it was their intent to engage in aggravated stalking and being offered for that reason. Its response? Um, well, I don't believe that a uh, evidence of a conspiracy uh, leads testified at the Stand Your Ground hearing regarding comments both by uh, Tim Blake and Carrie Blake. It is conspiracy because it's an agreement by two or more persons to violate the law. So certainly it's evidence of a conspiracy between the two of them about this. And I think uh, it put the other conduct then shows that there were other people that joined in that conspiracy. But they have sworn testimony in this case uh, regarding uh, admissions by both Bruce Timothy Blake and Carrie Blake. Okay, so you believe that they are admissible under that theory, under what authority specifically, Mr. Eisenhower? Uh, <coughs> Co-conspirator testimony is an exception to the hearsay rule. It is part of our defense. There is a conspiracy by what the Blake. What is that site that you're relying on? That's what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Don't have a site handy. Uh, I just want to be very clear as to what it's being presented for. Let me uh, 
ask, um, how long do you anticipate the testimony will be? So perhaps what we need to do um, is allow the defense to proffer it outside the presence of the jury, and then I can properly rule as to whether or not it is admissible under the authority and the provision that you're going to provide to me in just a moment. My only issue is that I have, I believe, is the jury still in the hallway? All right, should we bring them in at least to release them for lunch and then come back and um, after the proffer I'll rule on whether or not it will be presented to the jury? What time do you all want to come back this afternoon? <laughs> okay. may, may I have the attorneys approach for just a moment, please? All right, let's bring the jury back in, please. All right, please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, court, excuse me, the jury's back in the courtroom, and have you all followed my instructions during our brief recess? Yes. Yes. Anyone aware of any violations of any of my instructions? No. All right. Um, we're actually going to release you for your lunch recess at this point, but I wanted to make sure I brought you in and to give you the time to be returning. So I'll ask that you come back at 1.20. It gives you uh, plenty of time for lunch. And again, make sure that you follow my instructions during the lunch recess. At this time, you all may be excused for lunch. Thank you. All right. Please be seated. All right, at this time, the jury has been excused from the courtroom, and the defense would like to um, proffer the testimony of Mr. Huntington. So let's call him in, please. Please step forward, sir. Please step to the podium. And please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. All right, please have a seat over here on the witness stand. Again, this is a proffer. <coughs> Sir, once you are seated, if you would please state your full name. Lehman James Huntington. Can you spell your last name, please? H-U-N-T-I-N-G-T-O-N. Thank you. You may inquire. All right. Mr. Huntington, back in uh, August and se through September of 2012, where were you residing? Um, RSV, Royal Spanish Villa. And is that in Titusville? Yes. And uh, while you were a resident there, did you come to meet uh, people known to you as Tim and Carrie Boy? Yes, I did. And how is it that you met them? I met them through one of the tenants okay. that lived there. In the August uh, time frame, 2012, uh, did you have conversations, conversation or conversations with them uh, regarding their interaction with the neighbor? Yes. And what exact, let's start with Tim Blake, the man in the relationships. Can you tell the court uh, what Tim Blake told you about uh, his intentions uh, toward this neighbor? Um, after he welded a hitch on my truck, we were talking, I think we had a beer. And uh, he said, well, it's time to go fuck with the neighbor. And I said, what do you mean? And what did he say? And he said, we, every night we go home and fuck with the neighbor, have a few beers, and it's our entertainment. We just mess with him. And I said, well, how? And he, he didn't elaborate exactly how. Just okay. Now, did you also have similar conversation with Carrie Blake? Yes. And tell the court about conversation or conversations that you had with Carrie Blake. Well, that was limited. She just uh, said that it was every night they go home. Uh, have a few beers and fuck with the neighbor. That's just what they do. Um, it was their entertainment, is what she told me. Okay. So both Tim and Car uh, Carrie Blake acknowledged the fact uh, that it was part of their continuing plan to engage in this harassment of the neighbor. Yes. That would be the testimony that I would proffer. You just want to make argument? Yeah. Okay. So can I allow Mr. Huntington to step down? Okay, sir, you may step down. Okay. 
think that's appropriate. So, sir, we'll need you to be back at 1.30, please. Okay, thank you. Oh, you want Mr. Huntington to retake just, the witness stand? Just because Mr. Eisenhower is watching. Sir, I need you to retake the witness stand, please. Only a few weeks. Okay. Do you know when you had them? Not an exact date, no. Okay. Do you know a month? I'm pretty sure it was August. It was summertime. Uh, I... Okay, well, that, that, that's what I'm asking. So, do you know uh, when you met them? Uh, and then, I want, and, and your answer is, do you, do you know when you met them? I'm not sure exactly when I met them. The first day I met Mr. Blake is the first conversation we had. And then it continued after that. Okay. All right. So you had more than one conversation with him about this? Not with him, around him. He was conversating with someone else at the time. Most of the time, the, after the first conversation we had together, okay. it wasn't a one-on-one. -on -one. All right. It was in the area. Would have been a couple of days later. They came over mostly every day. Ever specifically asking Mr. Blake why he didn't like this neighbor? No, he just he offered it up. He just said he he hated him. Okay. Well, do you recall any specific statement that he made along those lines to you? I'm going to refresh your recollection to see your testimony at the prior hearing. Yeah, I. I... <clears throat> part of the proper. said it was going to be him or me. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? No. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. And yes, we'll sir. need to see you back again at 1.30. Thank you.
part of the predicate. We've already laid the predicate of actions that are consistent with the conspiracy. There's all sorts of testimony uh, already before the jury regarding the actions of these people, them acting in concert uh, and engaging in acts that establish this. What this establishes is there was, in fact, an agreement to engage in this type of behavior. It was made in the further because these comments were made in terms of time to go now. They were made uh, amongst at least two of the conspirators, uh, Carrie and Tim Blake. So one, it helps establish the predicate that there was, in fact, a conspiracy agreement between two or more people to violate the law. Secondly, it made a further conspiracy by showing their actions and the fact that they're about to engage. Time to go. Time to do this. <clears throat> so, again, it's an exception to the hearsay rule. These people are conspirators. It's core to our defense that there was a conspiracy by the Blakes, the Hembrees, the Hickey Ors, Jessica Nobles, Kim Cass, to engage in the crime of <clears throat> forcible felony crime of aggravated stalking. There was an agreement. This establishes that agreement, furtherance of that agreement, uh, and the other evidence uh, goes to independently establish the existence of the conspiracy. Anything further from the state? So nothing further. Okay. All right. I'll reserve ruling on the issue. I will allow us to take our lunch recess. We'll be back at 1.30. Um, obviously, the jury's coming back at 1.20, so uh, I'll announce my ruling at that point, and then uh, the defense can proceed from there. We'll be in recess until 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>